Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Frogs Insider Podcast. I am Melissa Trebowasser, joined this week by Brandon Helwig of UCFSports.com, who is here to preview something, do something that's never been done before. That is preview a TCU-UCF football game, because these two teams will be meeting this weekend, Saturday night, for the first time in either school's history. I'm excited about it. Brandon, I know you've got to be excited about it, uh, but first off, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, we just started this week off. We had you know, a little press conference earlier today at UCF with Gus Malzahn. Of course, he was heaping the praise on Sonny Dykes and Kendall Bryles. And there's that whole uh, relationship with Kendall Bryles and KJ Jefferson, you know, UCF starting quarterback who came from Arkansas. His best seasons at Arkansas were working with Kendall Bryles a couple years ago. So there's that kind of parallel as well. And UCF fans, we're just excited, you know, for this week because it, while it's not the season opener, uh, it kind of feels like it is in a way because UCF had two warm up games, uh, begin the year with a FCS New Hampshire, uh, played Sam Houston last weekend, and so it just hasn't UCF hasn't really been tested these first two weeks, and everyone just is amped up uh, about this opportunity to go to go to TCU. I know you mentioned the two schools have never played. It just seems like these are the the two new, I, now it's all thrown out the window with all these new Big 12 teams yeah. this year, but it just seems like UCF and TCU haven't really, I mean, like you said, didn't play in football last year. And in men's basketball, I don't think the two teams met until the very last game of the regular season when everyone's already kind of thinking about, you know, conference tournaments, that stuff. So I don't feel like there's been a lot of connections yet between these two fan bases, but I know it'll get going this weekend. Yeah, and, and I think this weekend will be a great way to kind of kick off what I feel like could definitely be a good Big 12 rivalry. Uh, it's a blackout game. It's a night game. I've already seen uh, some of the, the fan accounts on social media going back and forth today. So uh, I definitely think, you know, these schools probably couldn't be more polar opposite when you look at size and location and, and makeup. But I think in the athletics programs, there's a lot of similarity. Um, UCF kind of walked the path that TCU walked in earning its way to the Big 12, you know, over a decade ago, having to, to prove they could win at the lower levels, having a supposed national championship or at least an undefeated season where they looked really dominant um, and, and to earn that power for now invite. Um, in this year two of the Big 12, how do you think their adjustment has been and, and how do you think they are kind of not, I don't want to say catching up because it seems like they're already a potential contender. Yeah, well, first off, I just want to commend TCU because they kind of created the the blueprint for programs like UCF. Uh, I, and I know back in the day, obviously, TCU was part of the Southwest Conference, but you know they were one of the teams on the outside looking in and, and they earned their way. I mean, they earned their way into the you know, whatever you want to call it, BCS, Power Five, or, or whatever we were calling it a few years ago with what they did in the Mountain West and what Gary Patterson was able to do. And and uh, so, yeah, um, and, and, and personally, I, I you know, you said it's played SMU every few years or so. So, you know, like I, you, I know you do the same thing when you would go on these trips. I always like, you know, exploring different campuses. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I think I can't remember what the first year I did. I know that I've done at least two or three times, but, you know, I'm there in Dallas. I want to check out uh, TCU. And I think the last time I did it was 2021. I think at that point we knew UCF was going to be joining the Big 12 in a couple of years. But so it was cool just kind of getting in the stadium and, and taking a look around and everything and just, uh, just seeing it. It's a beautiful campus. It's a beautiful yeah. facilities and what you guys got in the uh, in the basketball arena with the Hall of Fame and all the you know uniforms on exhibit and stuff. It's just really really cool. Uh, but what, what was your question? I, I was sort of rambling on a little bit. <laughs> Saying, you know, in, in year two of, of oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. been officially, how has the adjustment been? And, and where do you think UCF is on their journey to being a conference contender? Yeah, yeah. So UCF gets the big, they know they're going to the Big 12 to get the invite around the beginning of the 2021 season. Uh, that's Gus Malzahn. Uh, that's his first year at UCF. Uh, he's already started to overhaul recruiting a little bit. I, I think, you know, I, Josh Heupel was a previous coach. You know, he's doing great things at Tennessee. But recruiting was the one area that was probably not Heupel's strong suit. COVID didn't really help that either with the virtual visits and all that stuff. So Gus Malzahn comes in from Auburn. You know, I, I'm sure everyone's kind of familiar with his his tenure at Auburn. It was kind of up and down with their fan base. And after... You know, after a certain period of time, they wanted to make a change, and and uh, UCF had the late coaching change because the eight, 
Yusuf's AD went to Tennessee, and then he took Hypo with him a few weeks later because they needed to hire a new head coach. But uh, but ever since that Big 12 invite came in, I mean, Gus Malzahn's been recruiting for the Big 12, you know, kind of selling the vision. Yusuf still had to play one more year, 2022, in the American where they made it to the championship game before losing to Tulane. But they've been kind of gearing up for this. And I think what – it was kind of a, I don't want to say it was a rude awakening, but they really learned a lot about what they needed and kind of how they needed to build, build their team. Now, UCF did have, they did have the most success out of the four newcomers last year. They were the only team amongst Houston, BYU, and Cincinnati to reach a bowl game last year. But I just think, uh, you know, Gus need, realizes that they needed more depth. Uh, I think they were thin, uh, you know, as far as as, as as defense last year, particularly. Um, he made an offseason change at D coordinator, brought in Ted Roof, who was coming from the Big 12. He had been in Oklahoma the last couple of years. Uh, I guess he had a falling out with Brent Venables, but he came in to overhaul the the defense. Um, they really loaded up on transfer portal when you look at that side of the ball, uh, particularly just, you know, they needed linebackers. They needed some some guys in the in, in, in the backfield and everything. And uh, and so they really loaded up. That, that's that been the biggest difference. And like I said, it's only been two games against New Hampshire and Sam Houston. So we really don't know exactly how improved this UCF team is. But from the looks of it, they're much improved defensively. And that's not just coaching, that's talent as well. And that's, I think, kind of what... Gus learned last year because when you go on the road and you're facing a team like Kansas State and then you see, you know, UCF had Baylor was their home opener last year and completely just collapsed in the fourth yeah. quarter. And that was a game that they, you know, should have won like a 90% chance of winning that game only to see everything completely collapse in the in the last 15 minutes or so. But, you know, they, UCF lost you know, some close games last year. There was an Oklahoma game that you know, came down to the wire, couldn't pull it out. But then they shocked the world. They beat Oklahoma State, a game that, you know, everyone was thinking Ollie Gordon was going to run all over UCF's run defense, which was the worst, I believe, the worst in the Big 12 last year. So that's an area. the worst at TCU's, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so I, with the, with the, you know, with the portal, I mean, that helps. I mean, you can, you can create, you can, you can, you know, over the course of an off season. You can kind of fill those holes that maybe would have been a little bit harder to do in years past. So we'll see how where, where the chips fall this year. I know UCF likes the team they have. Uh, you know, obviously preseason predictions had Utah and Kansas State kind of the leader of the pack, but it seems like if you look at the top eight or nine teams, I think you can make an argument that all those teams kind of feel like they have a chance to contend for the Big 12 championship. And, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I know UCF feels like if all goes right, and KJ Jefferson, who I mentioned earlier, the quarterback, he kind of had a rough first week, but he, I think he was the number one rated uh, quarterback in the Big 12, according to the PFF grades this past week. He really re- rebounded in week two. So if he if he can play at a high level, uh, I think UCF ha- has a chance to do something this year uh, in, in the Big 12. Yeah, I mean, UCF was my dark horse pick. Um, you know, in, in the media poll, I, I went with what everybody went with, the Utah and Kansas State and Oklahoma State is kind of my top three. But to me, UCF is is definitely the one that's not being talked about as much as the best chance to, to make it to Arlington for a Big 12 championship because of a lot of the things that you mentioned. Um, they have an obviously very innovative offensive coach. They've restocked on defense, still probably not quite where they need to be to win a championship, but they certainly could end up there if the chips fall correctly. Um, you mentioned, well, b- before I get to the specifics on offense and defense, you kind of touched on this, but what would be a successful season? It, it, do you think that there's a goal? Is there a marker? Is there a game they have to win? What would define success for this iteration of UCF football? I think it's about you know taking taking that next step up. And for UCF last year, they did reach a bowl game. I mean, I, I think in that end, it was a successful season to a degree. I know as far as the program, as far as Gus Malzahn, they saw last season as unacceptable because then UCF lost the bowl game to Georgia Tech. And I guess we've seen Georgia Tech's having a little bit better season this year, but you know, finished the season six and seven. And Gus Malzahn and all his years as a head coach, whether it was high school or, you know, in college, he's never had a losing season. So I know that kind of ruffled his feathers last year. I, I think for me, I think in terms of the UCF fan base, they just they want to see 
the the the, the recruiting successes, the transfer portal successes, because you know Gus wins the off season. You know, I think I haven't looked to see if it's if it's you know I think Yusuf right now is number one recruiting rankings in the Big Twelve as far as this next recruiting class. I mean, I know UCF and TCU are kind of neck and neck as far as that goes, but. Gus has had a lot of lot of off season successes. They want to see that translate to the actual season, and I think for the fan base, they would like to see. You know, like you never know what's going to happen in this conference race. It's tough. There's there's sixteen teams. You know, there's going to be some good teams that are on the outside looking in. But I think it would be important for UCF to play meaningful football the last couple weeks in November. There's a road game at West Virginia the in the season on Black Friday against Utah. I mean, that game could mean something. I, I just I just think for for UCF, I, I think they would like to get to, you know, give or take nine wins or so and be in the mix for a Big Twelve championship. I think that's kind of the the expectation amongst the fan base at least. Nine wins would, would be a very successful season. Like you mentioned, 16 teams in this conference. It seems that a lot of teams are kind of in that similar mix. So nine wins would be a big year. I mean, I think TC fans feel similarly in that seven wins would show marked improvement. Eight wins would be a successful season, but nine lets you really feel like you're moving the right direction. Um, and just to, to kind of finish your point on recruiting, TCU currently number one in the Big 12, UCF number two, but I think that has to do with number of yeah. commitments. I know it's gone back and forth a little yeah. bit as UCF has gotten commitments. Maybe they had a decommitment a couple weeks ago that might have impacted that number. But I know both schools have been basically been at the top of the Big 12 rankings. Well, and, and UCF does have the highest um, average for like recruiting ratings, recruit rating at, at over 88. So they're barely edged out TCU. I, I think these two teams probably are best positioned to be the best recruiting programs in this conference going forward, which m- should mean that both of these teams are consistently playing late important games in November and, and hopefully playing for Big 12 championships across from each other for a while. Um, let's dive in to the specifics. You mentioned KJ Jefferson, like you said, didn't get off to a great start, um, but certainly looks like the type of quarterback that can be incredibly successful in Gus Malzahn's system. Uh, somebody that TCU fans really wanted out of the portal to come in and potentially challenge Josh Hoover. Uh, Hoover's looked better than fine in his first two starts, and, and he has played at least a power five or power four opponent in Stanford. But what are the early returns on KJ, not just through these first two games, which are difficult to evaluate, but what you guys saw and heard out of camp and, and how do you think he's fitting into his role? And is he good enough in the passing game to elevate UCF to that nine, 10 win mark? Yeah, that's an interesting link. Cause uh, I, I, think, I think we kind of forgot about that, that when, yeah. when he came out in the portal, I know UCF was instantly linked to him, but TCU with the Kendall Bryles connection as well, that I, did he take a visit to TCU? Do you no, know? I, as far as I heard, he was never given an offer, but I don't know if that's reliable information. I know there were conversations, I don't know if it ever got to the visit part of the equation. Yeah, yeah, but but he comes in and, and, and he's pretty much tailor made for what Gu, what Gus Malzahn likes likes to do. Uh, Gus actually recruited him out of high school. Um, KJ is originally from Sardis, Mississippi, uh, and his dream uh, KJ going through high school. You know, obviously, you know, players of that era, everyone looked at Cam Newton and saw what he was able to do at, at Auburn, uh, playing for Gus Malzahn, and his dream was to play for Gus Malzahn at Auburn. But at that point. Um, I believe Gus, he got a commitment from Bo Nix. And so they weren't going to take any more quarterbacks in that class. Bo Nix is the the legacy from Auburn. So obviously he was always going to Auburn. But that relationship had, was already set in high school. So when he hit the portal, and you know, last year, you know, UCF knew they needed a portal portal quarterback. They had kind of, you know, swung and missed on a few of the guys in early December. You know, Tyler Shuck from Texas Tech, who ended up going to Louisville. Uh, Grayson McCall from Coastal Carolina, he ended up going uh, to NC State. So they were, you know, I think in Baylor's quarterback, or um, uh, D- D- Daquan Finn, who was from Toledo, and now is at Baylor. They kind of kicked the tires on him too. But when KJ was a little bit of a later portal uh, entry, I think it was more in that mid-December time period. And you know, as soon as I saw that name hit, I thought. This this name is this name I'm sure is going to be linked with UCF, and it didn't take very long at all to figure out they were hot and heavy with him. And so, uh, you know, Gus said it. I think when they announced his his signing in early January that he he felt they really hit a home run. And and so and now it's all about just kind of making it work because we kind of have seen college football these first couple of weeks. You know, was it like sixty something percent? I think of, of college football teams are, are playing a transfer at quarterback. So you know, every every team, you know, Notre Dame, let's Riley Leonard. So we see all these 
all these all these programs are, are kind of working through some of them are going through growing pains. You know, it doesn't always it's not an, an instant chemistry fit. Um, so that's just something that I know KJ has been kind of working on since he, he got to UCF this past spring and just kind of getting comfortable with the offense, getting comfortable in the passing game, because in that debut against New Hampshire, the season opener on the Thursday night, it was rough. I mean, everything else about that game was great for UCF. The, the defense was dominating, albeit against an FCS opponent. The running game, which is which is really going to be UCF strength this year. I mean, they look fantastic. Offensive line looked great, but KJ Jefferson really struggled throwing the ball. Like he couldn't he couldn't hit the side of a barn. He was overthrowing guys. He was he threw it. You know, one interception. There was other balls that should have been intercepted. He I mean, he looked bad. I mean, there's no su- there's no sugar coating it. He looked pretty awful. And so going into Sam Houston this past weekend, you know, everyone was kind of wondering like is he the answer are we going to have a quarterback controversy if he doesn't look very good but he to his credit uh you know you know, I, I know coaches say things on these coaches shows, whether the, whether they're true or not. I know Gus on Thursday night said this was the best week of practice that KJ has had since he's been at UCF. I, you know, I've kind of heard stuff like that from coaches before, and whether it's true or not, I don't know. But he he performed a lot better. I, I you know, when you just go by the PFF grades, I think he uh, was a 92. I don't know if you ever look at those or not, but that's like that's an elite grade. That was the top rated quarterback in the Big 12 this past week and one of the tops tops in the nation but he was very efficient, but they won't, he, 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 with UCF's running game and they pretty much have four running backs who could start at a lot of places. And that's led by RJ Harvey. He rushed for 1400 plus yards last year. Um, he had already had more than hundred yards against Sam Houston. And that was just in the first half alone. So with that running attack, you know, if they get going, KJ, you know, won't have to, you know, he won't be forced to throw the ball a lot. You know, they, if they stack the box, obviously he's going to have to throw. But, you know, getting that passing game going, I know, is something that you know, I'm anxious to see how that how he does against, against TCU because he's not going to be facing New Hampshire or Sam Houston this weekend. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting because TCU's run defense was so abhorrently bad in 2023. If you saw what K-State did against that that unit, um, it was it was ugly from the get-go. And R.J. Harvey is one of those truly, truly special backs. But like you mentioned, he's not the only great runner in that backfield. Penny Boone, Miles Montgomery are both off to really solid starts. Um, you've got you know, five guys now averaging over seven yards a carry, which is absolutely insane, um, though Ja'Cory Brown is doing it on pretty limited snaps. Um, what What is it about this unit that makes them special, especially R.J. Harvey? What What is kind of his bread and butter? And then how good has the offensive line had to be in order to enable this? Or is it just they have special players behind them making their job easy? It's a little bit all of the above. RJ Harvey is an interesting story. He was originally a quarterback in high school, as you know, a lot of got a lot of times the best athlete on the team plays quarterback in high school. And so he was a quarterback for a team here in Orlando, Edgewater High School. And, you know, he wanted to play quarterback. So, you know, that's what schools are recruiting him. And, and most schools like UCF, when Josh Heupel was here, was just like, Yeah, you know, we're recruiting you. We want you, but we think you'd be a running back. But so he originally went to Virginia. Uh, who said, hey, we'll give you a chance at quarterback. And I think he was there for like two days, or two weeks. And they said, we're we're going to move you to running back. And so he didn't like that. He's like, well, if I, if I was going to play running back, I just would have gone to UCF. So that's what he did. Uh, he hit the portal, uh, you know, after his freshman year at Virginia. And it's just kind of, it's kind of been a process for him. He's, he's had some setbacks with injuries. Uh, I think in 2021, which would have been Gus's first year at UCF, he was on track to, to, kind of, to be UCF starting running back. And then he tore his ACL in preseason, like a couple weeks before the season was going to start. So he was he was out that entire season. And so his first year is kind of, you know, being being, you know, one of the top options at, at running back was 2022. And then, you know, this past year really was his breakout um, ended with 1400 yards. Um, I think it was really one of the best rushing seasons that UCF has ever had. You know, at least since Kevin Smith back in 2007 uh, was running wild with George O'Leary's offense. He, that year, Kevin Smith finished second uh, in as far as the single season rushing to Barry San- nearly eclipsed Barry Sanders Barry Sanders single season rushing record. Uh, but his, his 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 vision is 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 one of the best I've seen in terms of just knowing where the holes are are, are going to op- open up and uh, obviously tremendous speed. But then, you know, UCF's depth, you know, 
you mentioned Miles Montgomery, a transfer from Cincinnati. He was their backup last year, but he's looked amazing this year. I mean, I, I don't think UCF misses much of a beat at all when, when RJ's not in the game. I mean, he's he's kind of like, like a missile firing out of a, you know, uh, a, a cannon coming out of what analogy I want to use, but when he burst through the hole, I mean, he is, he is lightning. Um, and he's looked really good. And there was a lot of hype before the season, um, about Penny Boone. He was, uh, he was, a I think the max offensive player of the year last year. He also rushed for 1400 plus yards, uh, uh at his previous school Toledo. He was originally going to go, uh, to Louisville, uh, he he was there in the spring. He was maybe going to go to Kentucky. I don't, I, you know how it is with transfers. He transfer one place. You don't like what happens in the spring. I guess you can transfer somewhere else. So that's what he did. He ended up at UCF after first going to Louisville in the spring, and uh, he's kind of been that second half guy, just to kind of you know give RJ and Miles a rest. But you know their running back room, and Johnny Richardson's a guy who's been here you know five years already. So uh, that's that's a really good unit, and, and honestly. Um, I think it's the best in the Big 12. I mean, I know there's a lot of talented running backs in this league, but I just think when you look at the depth that UCF has, I, I just, I, I personally, you know, maybe I'm biased. I probably am. I think it's the best. Well, I, I, between the depth in the running back room and what KJ Jefferson can obviously do running the football, uh, it, it's it's potentially terrifying for TCU fans, um, especially because Ashton Daniels had a lot of success running against that TCU defense against and the Stanford game. Um, and even last week against LIU, they were able to break contain a little bit and let the quarterback get out and run. Um, so I think that's going to be the, the interesting matchup is can TCU either put UCF in a situation where they can't just run the football or will they be able to at least contain that, that talented unit enough to make it where Gus has to, to call more passing plays to keep the TCU defense honest. That, that to me is going to be really the story of the game. Um, really quickly on the defensive side of the ball, like you said, it was a unit that struggled last year that didn't come in with a ton of hype this year. What is maybe one or two things that you've seen from the defense that gives you encouragement as they move into tougher competition? Yeah, and like I've said a couple of times, um, you know, with the level of competition that UCF has played, it's kind of hard to to really hang your hat on it quite yet. But just from what we've seen, is is that is that the run defense looks a lot of you know, much improved over last year? I think they were. You know, if if they weren't the worst, they were they were right up there with the worst run defense in in the Big Twelve last season. Now UCF has a deep defensive line. They did have an injury issue uh, of late. One of the backup D tackles, John Walker, he's out at least for a few weeks with a knee injury. Uh, but they do have a little bit of depth there. Uh, the, the the UCF linebackers are much improved. Uh, they brought in Deshaun Pace. He was arguably one of Cincinnati's best defensive players the past few years. Uh, he, you know, he was part of their 2021, you know, college football playoff team. He comes in over the off season, uh, Ethan Barr, uh, was a, a you know, two time team captain, I believe at Vanderbilt the last couple of years. Uh, he, he's a team captain now at UCF. He's UCF's middle linebacker. You know, they brought in some depth. I mean, they basically can go four deep at linebacker, which, you know, doesn't, I mean, that's what every program should have. But last year, UCF literally had one guy maybe at linebacker that was were it may, maybe two like the second linebacker really probably wasn't up to big 12 standards and they had to play like every snap like UCF's depth was so bad they, they had had uh, Josh Seleskar uh, one of UCF's defensive ends he would play every single snap in a game that's how you know even in that position they just had no depth and that's unheard of. I mean, you know, you don't have defensive ends usually playing every snap in a game. That's crazy. Uh, but that's the area between you know transfers. Uh, and and some of the transfers that you know may not have had as much. There were some transfers that had a little bit more hype than others. But UCF brought in a couple guys. Uh, one was a corner from UAB, Mac McWilliams. Another was uh, a safety, I believe, from East. I think it was from East, yeah, East Tennessee State. Sheldon Arnold. Those guys have played really well this year. That's kind of the cool thing about the portal. Sometimes there's these guys that you may not know their names, or you know, you may not know where their schools are located. Sometimes, uh, but they do really well at, at different levels, and they get the opportunity to to go to a, a bigger program and really shine. But you know, I'm just anxious to see how these guys do against a, a real legit big, you know, Big Twelve team. I got, you know, we all got questions going into this week, and that's really what I want to see is this deep defense as good as, as good as advertised yeah i mean to me this is like when i saw game day was going to um south carolina or whatever i was like honestly what a missed opportunity because tcu ucf has a chance to be the most fun game of the weekend I i'm fascinated to see how this one plays out um you know i think these are post 
two teams that could very easily be knocking on the door of a playing for a big 12 title or could be struggling to get the seven wins. Like, I just think there's so many unknowns. I, I think UCF is really well positioned to be playing, like you said, meaningful games the last couple weeks of the season. And, and I, I unfortunately think they're really, really good, which I don't want to have to say going into, you know, the big 12 opener um, against them. It, it makes me a little bit nervous, but uh, to me, this is going to be a great environment. I was super impressed with the TCU student section the first half last week against a, you know, a team that no one even knew existed. Um, they had the fourth highest student attendance at a football game in school history. I have a feeling they might break attendance records Saturday night. The weather is supposed to be perfect. Um, this is a couple of undefeated teams rolling up and, and the first time they've ever played. I think it's going to be a really, really electric environment. Um, you know, for UCF to come on the road, to go into TCU, which is not, you know, some powerhouse program right now. It has a ton of question marks, but what do you think needs to go right on Saturday night for UCF to start conference play 1-0? I think UCF needs to have the KJ Jefferson that, you know, did really well against Sam Houston, have the same KJ Jefferson show up. Uh, just because there just there have been some some whispers. I know I kind of talked about it earlier, but just you know, we don't really see much in terms of the off season. Like you know, spring practices are closed, preseason practices are completely closed. When the media media can go in for like fifteen minutes and see the Duke team doing warm ups and stretching, but we really can't see any real Gus, football. Gus went to the Gary Patterson School of yes. involvement, huh? Yeah, so but zero. <laughs> yeah, but you hear whispers and and different things coming from the program, like you know, KJ had a really bad scrimmage or was not looking good and uh, UCF's top donors they call them shareholders uh, they were able to attend one of one of the the UCF scrimmages in August and, and some of the people really weren't all that impressed with KJ then so there were some whispers that he was struggling a little bit and so you know uh, so that's kind of been a recurring issue but I've also heard that he's more of a game quarterback than a practice quarterback which I guess is the only thing that really matters right I mean it's how you perform in the actual game so UCF needs needs KJ to have a, have a, have a good game, and I think they're going to lean on those running backs. So they're going to make you know TCU try to, try to stop those guys. Um, and you know on on the other side of the ball, um, you know UCF defense has I think they've been able to force four four turnovers through the first two games. Like I know it was lower level competition, but they've done a pretty good job of, of turning the ball over, and that needs to continue as well. But the the, the big question for me though is is how is this team going to play on the road because they struggled on the road in Big Twelve play last year um just you know whatever it was or just travel or just the level of competition you know they have not really proven to be a great road team under gus malzahn and you know maybe there's you know certain reasons for that opponents being played or whatever uh but this this is a big statement game you know for ucf and for gus just to show that you know they they you know they have a good opportunity if they can get past tcu you have a, a bye week, and then Colorado comes to town uh, for the Big 12 home opener in the bounce house, which obviously the whole circus side show with That's Dion in prime be, time. You talk about electric environments, the bounce house is going to be rocking for prime. Yeah, for sure. but they've got a great, great you know, I, I think personally, I think the TCU is the bigger test than Colorado. We'll, oh, yeah. we'll see what happens, yeah. but on after the field, yeah. on, on the field anyway. So if they can get past TCU, I think they've got a great opportunity to, uh, to be 4-0 going into um, what will be a uh, much-anticipated, hyped, non-conference matchup. UCF goes on the road to Florida mm. uh, the first week of October. Uh, so, yeah, this is a, a huge test for, for UCF. And I know, uh, you know, some fans, I, I, I don't want to say, I mean, Gus is not not on the hot seat, not at all, but just some fans, they want to start to see results from Gus. And this is, this is a big game to, to kind of win those fans over if UCF can beat TCU. So do you want to go on record with a prediction for Saturday night? You know, I hadn't thought about it, but I can come up with something on the fly. Um, I do like UCF's chances. Uh, no disrespect to TCU. And I know it was the first game. Um, I did see most of that opener against Stanford. Um, I, I know you t took TCU a little bit, little while before they were able to, to you know, get on top and, and pull out the win. Um, I know it'll be a lot tougher, you know, than UCS first two games, obviously, but I like, I like UCF chances in this game. I think they're going to win a close game. I'm thinking something along the lines of maybe 31, 24, something, something in that range. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, that I just looked up the spread and it's one and a half points, which is, I mean, basically might as well be a pick em, right? And for a road team to, to, to only get one and a half points seems pretty insane. So I, I'm very anxious for this one. I, like I said, I think the environment's going to be great. I think this is obviously far and away the toughest challenge TC has faced this season um, and, and sets up a, a tough stretch for the Horn Frogs. So I, I think just like you were saying for UCF, this is a huge momentum game for TCU as well. So Two teams that are going to come in with a lot on their shoulders in this one, and it should be fun to see how it goes. Uh, Brandon, tell folks where they can find you, find your work, find all of your insight um, on UCF as someone who has been covering this team since they were a turned a legal adult, which is kind of insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've been the longtime publisher of uh, UCFSports.com, part of the Rivals Network. I'm UCF Sports on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I've been through TCU and Fort Worth just kind of sightseeing, but I can't wait to see what the atmosphere is going to look like on Saturday night. I think it'll be a great showing of UCF fans. I mean, like pretty much every university in the country, they've, they've got an alumni contingent in Dallas-Fort Worth. I know UCF has a decent group there. So between those guys, and I think this is probably going to be the highest. That, you know, everyone just kind of circles, you know, what road games you want to attend and everything. And it, it seems like amongst the fans from Florida, it seems like this is probably will be the most popular road trip. I'm not sure exactly, you know, how many fans. It'll at least be a few thousand, I would think. But I know this should yeah. be a, a, a popular game for, for road tripping UCF fans. Well, I know it'll be a popular return trip for TCU fans whenever that gets put on the schedule because we all want to take a little swing through Disney World, too. So, Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Uh, look forward to what should what we're all hoping, I think, is a, is a pretty epic start to Big 12 play this year. All right. Thank you very much for having me.